I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like. So you had a brief introduction to the panelists, but what I would like each one of them to do, and only one of them is prepared to do this, please introduce yourself in five words or less. You want me to go for it? Sorry. Um, father, husband, revolutionary, media, uh, teacher. Okay, thank you. Um, Tony Browder, lover of all things African. All right. All right. Jenny Chaplin, reader, um, insightful, um, and voiced. Okay, thank you. Uh, Louise Clavel, knowledge library, um, uh, growing people, uh, making things a little clearer. Alicia Prince, eternal student and committed advocate. All right. Thank you. And that's just the beginning. Now you have another five word assignment, then we're going to run, jump into some real questions. Five words a review of this film. Your impressions. Five words. No, you started last time. You can be, a, you can, you can be the cleanup man. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, five words. A necessary story. Unnecessary? A necessary. A necessary. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, important to the struggle, we should understand um, a direction for what may work in the future. More than five, but thank you. <laughs> <laughs> We're hoping you, brother. Um, very significant story, um, and I like how you opened up. It's only one story. I'm good. History would, would, written with light, sound, and lightning. Thank you. Thank you. This is not our film. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Welcome to our living room. We have our panelists. We know who they are. We've got their short reviews of the film. But I'm going to throw this question out to each of you all. And you can have up to two minutes to reflect on it. But give me um, how accurate do you think the historical references are in this film? And I know we have some historical experts here, some cultural experts, and some Renaissance men and women. No, we all we all five words. Um, so I think that there are. It, it was some very strong historical references. I do think that some of those references, um, personally, I was double checking. Um, I think it was told in a way, and I think with a story like this that a lot of people don't know, we do have to stay true to history. Um, only because this is the first time a lot of people will hear this story. And the first time a lot of people will touch and understand what it meant for slavery revolt and um, abolitionists and, and those who, who were concerned during this time, but those who actually revolt and who fought against what was quote unquote the norm at the time. So I think it's important that we stick as close as possible to those historical perspectives because I think ultimately that it makes you want to get down and, and understand what are those those primary sources. Where does this come from? Why why was this the case? So I think that's really important. That's a really good comment, Alicia. Um, I think that when we project ourselves into a literature approach to history, it's a very difficult thing. I think when um, uh, Storin was writing his confessions, he was projecting himself into some uncomfortable and unknown territories. And I know that where Dr. Gray was writing his original confessions, he was projecting himself too. And he was trying to deal with a situation that scared the pants off the Europeans and write about it in a way that possibly would never happen again. But with that said, if he didn't write it, we wouldn't have anything. So I like to hear and write and to have other people write and explain their position so I can know a little bit more about the writer, not necessarily about the historical figure. From Storin and Gray, I've really deducted the fact that we know a lot of things that Nat Turner was not. Parker's um, 
started out saying, you know, based on the true story. So that um, opens the door for us to um, interrogate the film. And I think cinematic productions are very, um, a good venue for us to, uh, to prod us into searching for different stories, different venues um, like museums, um, for um, literatures, um, to see what came before the Nat Turner story, like other literatures um, like Phyllis Wheatley, um, like David Walker's Appeal um, that was written. Um, Nat Turner put things into action Why David Walker's appeal um, wrote an appeal to the horrors of the institution of slavery. Um, so um, what we have here is um, something that is in right, something not only, you know, you have the voice, but you also have the action as well. Um, in addition to that, I think, um, you, um, I like going back to that adage, you have a story, not the story. And it just pushes us to what, uh, what are in these museums, the objects, like at the National Museum of African American History um, and Culture, Nat Turner's Bible. And it just prods us into being more, um, greater intellects um, and greater scholars. So I like what cinematic productions, um, you know, forces us to do, be greater readers. Um, greater questioners of American history. Thank you, thank you. Um, <clears throat> this is a movie. Mm -hmm. The movie, this movie is like the Bible. It contains truth, but it is not true. Mm -hmm. um, creative license was taken in order to produce a narrative that would draw the viewer in and have you emotionally connect with the characters. So you have to look at every movie from that perspective. The idea is to be drawn into the character so that you would want to seek out more information about the personalities, go to the library, read and study so that you can dig up the truth. So the movie is just a catalyst. <coughs> so I don't have to go through and, and, and pick apart every scene that was not historically accurate. What I view the movie as, as a catalyst that gives us an opportunity to have a dialogue about a person who has been written out of the respectable commentary of American history. We need to not only talk about Nat Turner, but the hundreds of other men and women who stage rebellions throughout the United States. And we need to ask the question, why they staged those rebellions? What forces drove them to do that? We don't have to debate whether or not they were right or wrong. They were fighting for their lives, and so they were justified to do whatever they did. If we were in the same situation, we would have done the same thing and probably more. So let us begin to have an honest discussion about the history of the enslavement of African people, what that did to the enslaved, what it did to the enslaver. And then let us talk about the fact that we're still dealing with those issues right now. Slavery has not ended. It's, shaped, it's changed its form, but it has not ended. And it's only when we develop the courage to have an honest dialogue <coughs> about slavery and the various manifestations of slavery, then we can learn from this movie and all the other movies that tell aspects of our story. Put it behind this. Yeah, yeah there we go. I won't record this. Okay. okay. It's it's so that's it. That's, that's it. it. That's it. All right. So. So first of all, good afternoon. Uh, uh, it's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate uh, um, having gotten a chance to see the film and get a chance to talk with you all a little bit about it. Uh, the reason I said those five words uh, are similar to what Brother Browery was, was I think talking a little bit about that one, we have to remember that this is a media product, that whatever the, the, the goals or the wishes of, of Parker himself or our own response to the film, uh, this is a media product. And with all due respect to, to the wonderful people trying to make good work out of it, the film was selected to be, to be distributed by Fox Searchlight uh, at Sundance, not because we were gonna love it and, and, and find revolutionary value in it, but that, be, that they knew that, that white audiences would be willing to pay to see it. That's why Sundance exists, and that's why the process of having films vetted at Sundance, not to see who's going to make what, but to see what films will get the push and the advance and the promotional budgets. 
Uh, and that's based on what white audiences are willing to see. Uh, and a few years ago when we were doing some work on this, uh, um, borrowing from, from uh, some of the work of Ishmael Reed, I mean, he got, um, uh, he, he's the one that, for me, pulled out some of the statements that from executives at, at not at Searchlight, but at Lionsgate Films, uh, who said that they were, that at the time, and I know they no longer do this, but at the time they were distributing Tyler Perry films, specifically as the executive said in the New York Times, because he satisfies the niche market of, of black uh, films that, are, that white audiences will see. So we always have to remember that as an institution, media and the money-making interests involved in Hollywood uh, are looking at that. So then when they show films like this at Sundance, they want to see, well, what will white audiences be able to tolerate? And that's what I think some of the, the, where some of the shortcomings of the film come in. And that's why I just want to think it's important to remember that in terms of those of us who want to find revolutionary value in these media products, we have to remember that they're not for us. They're not made for us to encourage that kind of uh, response. So that's why we have to remember that, as Bro Brother Browder was saying, the very media that will promote this film are also denying us uh, recognition of the prison strike, the biggest prison strike in, in this country's history taking place right now. These are the real descendants. So the film's end, one of the problems that I had with the way the film ended, the legacy we're meant to see is brothers fighting with the American flag waving behind them as we fight, you know, it, it, with this idea that we, that, was, that we have overcome something and we are in some sort of new moment. But as the 13th Amendment reminds, slavery is perfectly legal. It just requires uh, 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 persecution of a crime first or uh, uh, being convicted of a crime first. And that's why we have more black people in prison today than were held as slaves at the height of enslavement and why more money is made off of us in prison cells today than was made off of us at the height of enslavement. So that's why I think we see that, that huge contradiction in terms of what films will be promoted via, versus what media will not um, cover. Just very, very quickly, you know, I, I think when Brother Browder makes this point that, that it's important to remember um, that the film, again, encourages us to see the legacy only in one way, waving the American flag, fighting for the Union. It does not encourage us to see what I think we should be seeing is the grander tradition of rebellion that the film does not allow us to see. So we see Nat Turner as a singular actor. Uh, we don't hear about him most likely having read the work of David Walker, as my sister brought up, or the many other folks fighting for freedom, uh, uh, men and women at the time, and being part of a broader tradition that he extended and was participating in um, that did lead to the true true end of, of uh, official enslavement. Um, I do like that they did say, by the way, I, I love that they called the, brother, the, the, the folks Africans at the end. He, he used the phrase enslaved African. I think that's very important. And I do think to the extent that it is possible that we try to make this a teachable moment. I don't agree that, that films offer that often offer that. Often I think that films and popular media stand to blunt any possibility that we might access real history and use it in a, in a more appropriate way. Um, but, I, but I am hopeful uh, that, that this may be sometime, uh, maybe a different moment, given what's happening in the streets with, with the uprisings, that this film may encourage some deeper, uh, uh, not only investigation into that history, but how that history is still playing out today. Well, thank you, and I think, you know, we've got a couple of really great points made, and one is, um, one that I'm picking up is, does this film answer all questions? Does this film relay things to us that... Oh, there's a question. There's a question. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm sorry, I had to leave. We were coming we yes. were on the house side. Yes. It's wonderful. Yes. Hopefully you all can do this in the evening. I commend my friend, Luis. Excellent job. But um, get to the point that this brother was saying, um, of late, the, the latest box office for the Wicked has this particular genre with the health, the butler, 12 years of slave, um, uh, Thelma, why is it that this particular genre is really popular, you know, and then you have the cities like underground and stuff that want to keep us in bondage and slave? What, what is the reason? Well, it, for me, in some way, it, I, you know, I don't see this as a brand new moment. I was thinking as, as the scene we were watching where, where, where Parker's being whipped, that this is just this generation's glory. And then we have to, like, we're reliving the trauma over and over again. So and we're, we're seeing, and, and I even made a note that we see more black suffering in this film than white suffering, even though often many of us are being promoted, having this film promoted to us as we get to see some revenge. And it's very limited. More black suffering is depicted, as is the case. And then there's a whole media industry political economy behind that right now, and some of the work that Dr. Sophia Moja Noble is doing on that, um, and how the internet is making money off of us watching all of our black suffering and reporting on it and all this. 
So I think, but I think to your, what I heard you say, if I can throw my projecting, my interpretation on what you're saying, the reason that we get these things brought back to us is because they're meant to blunt the activity in the street. They're meant to quell and respond, I think, negatively to, the, to, to what's happening in the street. That, you know, when, when John Henry Clark edited 10 Black Writers Respond to William Styron's Nat Turner, one of the points that I believe uh, John Oliver Killens made in that was that the commentary about Styron's Nat Turner was as much uh, um, a, a, an attempt to diso disassociate the black power struggle happening in the streets from Nat Turner. Okay. That's what I think this film is meant to do from the perspective of those who wanted to promote and support it. You want a little rebelliousness, we'll give it to you, but back in 1831 in this one instance that ends with the flag waving, don't connect to it now and see that you are the heirs to that struggle right now and then extend it in your own 21st century setting. Go back to where you see yourselves as only enslaved Africans, of course nothing prior, no African history before that, and then uh, um, uh, cut it off there and leave it there and leave it in the past and find your, 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 your um, peace in the flag waving at the end and the fact that you aren't a slave now, which is what, at least what we're theoretically supposed to see yourself as. Can, can I add to, to another part of the question that I, I would like for us to consider as well with this film, the role that Christianity played in keeping us passive. That has to be looked at because there's no coincidence that all of our leaders have all come out of the church and they have all taught us to be passive. And if we understand the history and, and, and something that was slightly alluded to in the film, but of course he didn't have time to get into it, uh, we need to understand the significance of the work of uh, Reverend C.C. Jones uh, in 1842, who wrote the religious instruction for the Negro in the United States as a response to uh, slave uprisings. Mm -hmm. And he specifically pulled out of the Bible all of the passages that told slaves that uh, God ordained that there be slaves and masters. Mm -hmm. And that's when they began to uh, give enslaved Africans Sundays off so that they can listen to the ministers. Build them with this nonsense. So we, we got a taste of that in the film, but of course he didn't dig down deep. So we have to be able to project this social engineering from 150 years ago into the present moment. What is the largest institution within the African American community? The church, the black church. And where does our leadership come from? The black church. And what is the what is the black church done to advance our cause? Not very much. Not very much. So this film affords us an opportunity to begin to have a conversation that we should have had 150 years ago. So let's start the conversation now, and, and let's be honest, let's be open, let's be respectful, so that we can move forward and become self-determining, not by embracing the God of our oppressors, but by looking at the interpretation of God or the creator as seen through the first human beings on the planet, and that is African people. If we do that, when we do that, we get a totally different understanding. No, I, I, uh, I would. Um, I guess I was shaking my head a lot. So I, I'm actually going to say, in some ways, I agree with you, but there are some ways that I disagree. And I, I, do, I would say that I, I thought the film actually, and if I take it from a perspective of, and I'm, I'm going to go from the per, a, a kind of younger generation perspective, um, and 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 the, the youth we have now. If I watched that film and I and I took from their perspective, there were a lot of places where I felt it spoke directly to them to get up and say, wait a minute, let me reflect. This is exactly what's happening right now in my society. I'm, this is literally my life, except the only difference is the year and the clothes. But everything else is exactly the same. This is, this is the battle that I'm fighting right now, that it might not be my personal battle, but my neighbor over in you know, North Carolina is fighting. My neighbor in Louisiana is fighting. My brother or sister there is fighting. And yet, here we are, all these years later, with no difference. Mm -hmm. So I, I would say that, yes, I agree with you. This is what mainstream media can take. This is, this is what the, the, the mainstream culture can take. But I think it requires us then from there. And, and I have to say, I appreciate the fact that there is this teaching lesson to it. I'm sitting here and I'm listening to it and I'm thinking, okay, well, the first thing I need to do is contact the different schools I work with and those people to say to them, this is your exact chance. The, the feeling that goes on now, that, that rebellious spirit, it's right there, but the kids don't know what to do with it. 
the community doesn't know what to do with them. But this right here says this is not something new. This is something that's been happening for hundreds of years. And here we are, how do we make a change? No, we don't need to get up and start, you know, going with knives and guns and axes and chopping heads off. That's not the answer. But there is an answer. And, and you know, <laughs> I'm just saying. I'm going to say, you know, I, but there is an answer. And the answer to me always comes with first knowing your history. Exactly. If you don't know what's happened before, what worked, what didn't work, because guess what? We can all say the idea was fantastic. Why did it work? If word of mouth, of course, was different then, you know, different things that happened. I was there in Baltimore when Baltimore had their, it was called an uprising. I don't want to call it an uprising. I hate that term. Mm -hmm. I, what happened in Baltimore happened as a response. It was a response to people neglecting over and over the same community of people. I was there when it happened. It worked in a sense. Why it didn't continue and then ultimately result in some of the things that they wanted to happen? I was there, I had the text messages that literally the first student sent out to tell the other kids, this is what we're going to do. It worked and these are 16 year olds who started this. So I think I agree with you in some ways. Yes, we've, we've made this very mainstream to, to push for it, but I do think that the some of the work that's in there and some of the ways it plays out can speak directly to today's generation to push them forward, to reflect on what's going on now. Just to clarify, I was only responding to the question no, no. of why we were seeing these films, not what I think the impact will be on specific audiences. I'm speaking from the institution's perspective, why they would want to support it with the film. Well, I think that both of your comments are clearly linked. I just think that what's, what needs to be discussed is how to watch a film. Because we shouldn't take this as if it's our bread and meat. We shouldn't take our children to a film and tell them to learn about Nat Turner. The problem is, is we have to be responsible and know that it's entertainment at a certain point. It's historical accuracy to a certain degree, maybe 30%. But if you don't follow up, do your fact checking, have some activities that go along with this, you can't put it into a plan. You see, we're always comfortable with some sort of like entertainment posture. This can't be that way anymore because of the examples in Baltimore that Alicia just spoke about. We've got to be more responsible for ourselves. Searchlight, 17 million, audience award. Uh, okay, at a certain point, what we're really talking about is connecting dots that have been separated to the extent that they're on purpose hard to connect. We talk to people at the library about primary source materials related to Matt Turner. People say we don't have anything. People say we have one thing. What we have is so many different parts that when you connect them, you get the picture of a people's psychological anguish and their response to it. What more do you want? I don't need to clap and eat popcorn and say, man, that was perfect. That's exactly what it was. No, it's a film. Huh? Unless you go through the slave narratives. You won't see the diary of the man from Baltimore who wrote about his wife being kidnapped and then he went and got her. That's a much better movie. What I'm saying, and I'm saying this to the degree of loudness because I feel a little cliche coming on to the panel. And African consciousness is dynamic. And those people with action and, and a way to really put their feet on the ground, land on a beach and say, we're gonna have an economic piece here. Land in there with your family and say, hey, my children are gonna move this much further. And understand that we're sitting on the collections of the American people, huh? But they're really the collections of the world. And until we participate with the interpretation, then we'll be stuck with something that's not quite enough. So this is something more than just going about saying, well, the media is always against us. This is something more than saying that the library's collection doesn't reflect a slave history that empowers me. This is saying that when we go into those collections, find the different pieces that relate to where we need to be going, and then highlight those, you've got to eliminate the good stuff from the junk. One of the greatest writers in the slave collection that we have said that you have to look at all of things about slaves and their masters with great scrutiny. Why? Because there's agendas that are being pushed. And when they're being pushed and they're so far apart, it looks like one is the ridiculous counterpart of the other. The thing is, is we've got to get towards some kind of reality to understand how to be revolutionary, which is just progress and goodness.
One thing I, you know, by working here at the Library of Congress, we are privileged to the knowledge that is here, the different media formats. And what I wanted to remind us is that there's a difference between a documentary versus a motion picture. Mm -hmm. A documentary is based on accuracy of detail. Mm -hmm. And also, as far as the religious aspect of slavery, uh, I went to see Minister Farrakhan when he did the Million Man March again. Mm -hmm. One thing he said that touched base with me was that scripturally, for those who believe in a monolithic God, a just God says the last shall be first. And we have served our divine universal term of slavery when we were brought out of bondage after the 400 years. Amen. So from that, and also from our art, by me being an art person and a photographer, the, our art teacher told me art does not need to be explained. It is the interpretation of the the person who is seeing it. Or if there's a blind person, he can only hear it. So what he hears, if it's the truth, it will prevail. And that's all I have to say. <laughs> so just before we go further, I just wanted to make one point because we're talking about media here. A movie, television, a, what are they? What should they be? A call to action. So what Brother Lewis, Luis was saying here, here's knowledge, here's a resource. The call to action from this movie shouldn't be to go grab a bag of popcorn. Yes, it could be to go to have another conversation, but don't think that this movie or any movie that you see is the reference point for all. It is just the catalyst to get you moving. So if you decide that you're not gonna move, if you fall into that programming, I'm sorry. But how many people here in this room are gonna go do a little bit more research? Okay, all right, can, can we, you, you got names and addresses? <laughs> we can follow up in two weeks? No, that's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm gonna open it up now for... I mix what I like, what I like, what I like, what I like.